Welcome to Making It with Terry Woolman, the show that explores the secrets, successes, and strategies for making it in the music biz. And now, here's your host, Terry Woolman. Welcome to the show, and thanks for tuning in. I want to let you know how much I appreciate you joining us every week on our show. If, if you missed our last interview, you can hear it and all of our episodes at entertalkmedia.com slash making it, or go to iTunes and look up Making It with Terry Wallman. So often I get asked questions about the creative process, so I created this show to focus on what it takes to have a lasting career in the ever-changing landscape of the music business. And you are really in for a treat today because um, I've invited somebody who I respect deeply and also like as a person, and we've known each other for quite a few years. As a matter of fact, we met in one of the best ways you can possibly meet somebody, at a party, at the end of the party, in a kitchen where all the interesting people gravitate just to talk at the end of the evening. And it was many years ago. I don't even know if you remember that, um, Chris, but we can talk about that in a moment. But I liked you from the moment that I met you, and, and I've been following your career as a fellow artist, but also just as a as a friend. Um, you know, I love the work that you do and, and the way you approach everything that you do. So let's well, get started. You, You're very welcome. Yeah. So let me tell everybody about you and yeah. let's, let's yeah, just yeah, get yeah. started. My guest today. I, I do want to talk about this party. <laughs> we will. Just yeah. See. Cause I, I, what, whose party was that? Steve Reed from the Ripping Oh Tins. my goodness. I do remember yes. that. That was a long time ago. It really was. Wow. I don't even remember what year that was. But um, let me tell yeah, people about yeah, yes, you. Go ahead, you go can ahead. ponder on that and yes, we'll circle yes, back on, me. on this, on this meeting. Let me tell you a little bit about Chris. Guitarist composer Chris Standring was born and raised in England, classically trained at the London College of Music, and further honed his skills during a decade spent working for the BBC, as well as a number of theatrical orchestras on London's West End. From there, he relocated to Los Angeles, becoming a top session player, recording with everyone from B.B. and C.C. Winans to Jody Watley and Carol Bayer Sager. Celebrating an extraordinary and prolific 20 years since the release of his debut album, Velvet, Standring spins his trademark retro meets modern vibes in fresh and unexpected directions. Since launching a very successful, creative, and lasting international career as a solo artist in 1998, he has released 12 solo albums and continues to dominate radio and the Billboard charts with his original music. His latest album is called Sunlight. Chris Standring? Welcome to Making It. Oh, Terry, that's a lovely opening. It's uh, all very flattering. I hope it's all true. I hope it's all true as well, because I got it directly from your website. Oh, well then, it's all lies. <laughs> if it's all lies, <laughs> I still believe it. <laughs> so, the party. Yeah. <laughs> Before we get into wow. your career, a mutual friend of ours, Steve Reed, yeah. uh, percussionist. Who I haven't seen, I don't think, since that party. Oh, no. well, I've seen him since, but yeah. I, it's been a while for me. Yeah. Um, percussionist for the Rippingtons and, and played with Miles Davis and has, has done a lot of great things and had his own studio. One of our yeah. friends who was early on in the, the, um, the home studio business. But anyway, that's where we met, yeah, and yeah, I'm not yeah. even sure if you had officially moved here yet. Oh, no, I was well and truly You here. were, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, you did make an impression on me. Like, I just went, I like this guy. You know, no. it's another guitar player and and not self-absorbed yeah. and interested in what other people were doing and talking about things besides music, as well as music. Yeah, I, I find it, it's music can be exhausting to talk about. <laughs> so um, even though I'm obsessed with it, and it 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 dominates my life. With people, I actually like to talk about other things. Right. Maybe because I'm I'm locked away and I'm doing this 
on my own. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit of a busman's holiday if I get out of the studio and I just talk about music. So, yeah, it's nice to just talk about life things. You know. Well, what else interests you? Well, this is the thing. Not much. <laughs> this is the odd thing. But, you know, people. I'm interested in people. Right. So, and I can't tell you exactly what about people is interesting, but personality and, and cultural things and, and what interests you, what makes you tick, you know? Um, what gets you up in the morning, your mm -hmm. drive, your passion. Uh, those are good, you know, things to chat about. Well, that actually... Rather than, you know, how you'd get around... D7 altered on a change. Exactly. <laughs> Much exactly. more interesting. You, this actually leads to what my opening question was yeah. intended to be, which is before we speak about your upbringing and your yeah. journey um, in life and as a musician, what inspires you in music and also what inspires you in life? Yeah. Um, what inspires me in music? Now, do you mean what inspires me to make music? Yes. Because uh, that's an easy one. Uh, you know, I used to think, God, if I if I could just live life more, I, if I could go to the beach or the mountains, or or just lock myself up in a in a loft for two weeks and write music, you know, all the romantic things that you think would create a piece of music. I've tried all those. I get nothing. <laughs> I get nothing. Zero. What what inspires me to make music is music. So I, I might hear a piece of music on the radio. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I'm, the, the genre that I'm in, uh, I, I have very little to do with as a listener. So the, the music that, I, that will inspire me to make the music that I write will be something completely outside the genre. It'll be a piece of orchestral music. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll be a piece of progressive club music from, from Austria by a couple of DJs right. or something. Um, some film music. Uh, a pop song, you know, just two bars. Like, Ooh, what, what do they do there? What is that? That's an interesting voicing. And I'll go, what if I do? What, what would I do with mm -hmm. that? You know, it's a germ of an idea. We're all, we're all looking for a germ of, a, of an idea to flesh it out, you know. And that's all it takes usually. And a trip to the mountains ain't doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I find myself doing the same when I hear something on yeah. the radio, on the radio in the car. Um, I love using Spotify for that if it's something, or if I'm in a club, a restaurant, um, a shopping mall, whatever. But if I hear something, I'll grab it, and then I go home and listen to it in my studio and find those two bars or that germ yeah. that yeah. excites me. Yeah. You know, it might even be the way a drummer approaches going into the bridge and switching from a loop to live yeah. drums in the chorus or something like that that makes me tilt in a way that I get excited. Yeah, I, 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 I totally agree. Yeah, I mean, and also just hearing fresh things. In, well, I mean, old ideas perhaps presented in a new way, um, in in a way that you haven't heard them before. So, right now, I'm I'm going crazy for orchestral music, mm -hmm. and just listening to uh, people like um, I can never remember his name, and I listen to him all the time. The Vince Mendoza. Mm -hmm. um, just listening to his note choices, his his arrangement ideas, and people like Johnny Mandel, you know, mm -hmm. and and I'm reading about what they do, and 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 the, the very idea that that some Vince he loves the idea of putting the the third against the fourth, that rub, yes, in, in a chord. So mm -hmm. It might be a major chord. So there's a so there's a third and a fourth there. And I find I'm doing this all the time. And I'm finding it's the relationship between the third and the fourth is the it seems to be the most singable melodic part of a phrase, which seems to create a hook. And I find if I listen to my songs, my most popular songs, it's all that relationship. Mm -hmm. And I'm always messing about that. That rub, I'm doing it with guitar parts, rubbing all the time. And it's the rub, I find, that creates the, the melodic interest, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and it, that's the excitement. So it's interesting listening to Vin Vince Mendoza, who does it in his orchestration all the time, you know. Did you study orchestration formally when you were at the conservatory? Well, I, I, I did study – I studied harmony, of course. But Let me ask you more specifically. Yeah. yeah. Are you, do you write your own string arrangements? Yes. And horn arrangements? Yes. Yes. And conduct and – I don't conduct. I'm a bit scared. Okay. I feel like I need to learn. Otherwise, I've got to hire somebody to do it, I, I'll which give, I might. I can give you some tips. Can I think you, you – yeah, I think – It can't be hard, can it? No. 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 And, and as a matter of fact, one of my conducting teachers had said, um, 
whatever you need to do to justify, we were learning to yeah. conduct Stravinsky right yeah. in the spring. Yeah. With which had you know it's in four four and then there's a one eight bar and right. then there's it's it's very technically right. Right. challenging and he said whatever you need to do to show the idea yeah as long as you show it clearly is justified yeah, yeah so. but I also think that if I've written the score and I learn how to conduct it I I don't want to stand in front of an orchestra and show them I know what I'm doing I want to be useful to them right you know what I mean because they're perfectly happy on their own they don't they don't need me yeah. You know, so so I got to. I think it's it's learning how to conduct and then learning how to be useful. You know. Yeah, but but basically, they you know musicians, um, I find love <clears throat> the 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 intimacy. Yeah. Of of being guided. Yeah, maybe they do by sure. the person who birthed the idea. Yeah, maybe. So yeah, yeah. there's there's something kind of beautiful about right. it. Right. I'll I'll teach everything I know yeah, after please. lunch. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, right now I'm I'm so deep in in orchestration, specifically strings. You know. I, yeah, I I've love done, strings. I've done a lot of horn arrangement, but but you know the the idea of French horns and oboes don't really interest me too mm -hmm. much. I just I'm into Klaus Ogerman and oh, just yeah. that rich, deep throaty string same, writing. Same here. Yeah. I'm 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 a sucker for it. You know. So I am too. Yeah. yeah. Um. So. I've got so many questions, but take me back to your early life growing up in your family. Yeah. Yeah, in England. Well, I lived on a farm, and uh, to to us, I have, you know, two brothers and a sister, and to us, we were living in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, my parents say to me for years, no, you weren't. I mean, <laughs> there was a village a mile away, and, and, a, and a town 11 miles away, and then London was an hour in the car. Well, to me, that's the middle of nowhere. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I had a little transistor radio. I remember listening to, to Radio 1, which was the, you know, the, the, the radio station we all listened to as kids. I would sit on, on top of the, the dishwasher and listen to me and Mrs. Jones. And th th that's when strings got to me, you know, the, the way Motown used them back in the day and, and Philadelphia strings. Uh, I mean, I think that's when it all happened for me. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I got I got very lost in 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 music, to quote a, a, a phrase, and I was a terrible farmer. I would let the sheep out all the time, and four o'clock in the morning, my dad would be coming into my room, swearing at the top of his voice. He said, "You've left the sheep out again. They're all over the village, so we'd have to go and get them." So things like that happened all the time. I was not cut out for farming, um, so. I couldn't wait to escape, you know. Was that you being sort of rebellious or that you just not being connected? I was just, I was just obsessed with music at an early age. Yes. I, I just loved it. I would go to bed with this little transistor radio attached to my head and listen to Radio Luxembourg, which mm -hmm. was called Fab 208 mm -hmm. um, back, in the, back in the 70s. And I just, it, it was mesmerizing to me. Um, yeah, it just gets, gets under your skin at mm -hmm. an early age and it's never left, you know. Um, were your parents uh, appreciative, supportive? Uh, my dad was was just lost in his farming yeah. world, and he was, you know, his gender role was bring home the bacon, mm -hmm. you know? literally. So, yeah, literally. <laughs> and we, so we didn't see him much. You know, we saw him for dinner, mm -hmm. and I didn't have a particularly great relationship with him at mm -hmm. the time. He got better. Good. Uh, my mother was unbelievably supportive musically. She loved classical music. She would have her Beethoven hour. So at four o'clock in the afternoon, she'd have a cup of tea and listen to Beethoven on the record and take, take a nap. And, and she would take me to my guitar lesson once a week. You know, a flask of coffee, sit out there in the car for an hour while I was, you know, just in tears because I couldn't play a G chord. Or sure. It, was. <laughs> it hurt. Oh, it hurt. Yeah, um, we have suffered for our yes, art. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> at the yes. beginning, and yeah, it was it was tough back in the day. But you know, you you get through that period. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I the simple answer is yes. My dad was a jazz lover, didn't care what I did. My mother was very supportive because she was into classical music and would like to see me go that way. You know, yeah. You had um, told me that you went to a private boarding school and, I did. That, and that you were a little bit rebellious there. Well, I didn't think I was rebellious, but that's how um, it. That's how my school teachers perceived me. Mm -hmm. And I, what were you going to say? Were you well, say they something? perceived you in a strong enough way that they asked you to leave <laughs> they, the school. That's right, and <laughs> never to return. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there, there was a few occasions where. You know, I remember one Sunday we're going into the into the local town of Reading, 
uh, we went to, went to go and see Saturday Night Fever. And I was a little shrimp. I was tiny. And we were going into pubs. So I was not allowed in pubs, but we were doing all these things. And I was dressed in these white loons with Gary Glitter boots this high, you know. <laughs> and uh, and then, I mean, a, a number of things happened that, that sent me to the headmaster and he he wanted to cane me and because mm. that's what they did back in the day. Yeah, it was uh, allowed. Yeah, and, and I too. refused to be caned. Mm. So that created a, a massive issue. Anyway... I mean, the the very last thing that happened is a friend of mine was leaving school that day and he asked me if I wanted to go to the pub for a drink. And I said yes. <laughs> what was I thinking? How old were you? 17. Okay. So we went across the street where all the teachers go and have their drinks, you know. <laughs> of course, we get caught. And I was sent to my housemaster and he said, we've, we've had enough of you. Right. You can stay to take your last exams the next couple of days, but then you've got to go and we don't want to see you again. <laughs> I would have had my my hide tanned when I got home. Did did your father blow up at you for that? No, he didn't care at all. Huh. No. Yeah. Well, wow. neither, neither did my mother really. Okay. Yeah. They shipped it, me off to boarding school. It was like yeah, whatever you know. So is it that they weren't worried about you, or they they were just <laughs> tired? No, not really. No. I mean, I, you know, I, I might have been a little bit rebellious, but I was still a bright kid. Sure. And they, they they were fine. They saw know? who you were. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Um, you know, I, I, I know that also there was a period where you took some time off, you know, you came to America. I did. And ended up in New Orleans for, yeah. you know, delivering pizzas for a week to yeah. make enough money to take a bus out yes. here. You started in Miami, which is where I was born and raised. How, oh, no how, kidding. how did you choose Miami to land? Uh, well, uh, we just, I mean, I, I came with, I, I had an, we had, we had a nanny mm-hmm. on the farm mm-hmm. uh, who was literally just two years older than me. Yeah. You know, she was. We, I had a younger sister at the time, so she was there to cook for the family while my mother was off doing something. Anyway, so we decided that we both wanted to come to America, and she had this idea that let's fly to my, Miami and hitch across the country. <laughs> what and year was now, this? Me, I just wanted to get straight to L.A. so I could see all my favorite musicians playing on all the Earth, Wind & Fire records that I was listening to. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I thought, well, if we're going to do this, you know, let's go see the world, you know. So, so, so let's do it. So we flew to Miami, and, and we stayed in the seedy little motel uh, that night. And the following morning, we literally just got on the freeway and put our thumbs out. <laughs> and uh, we got picked up by a bunch of people. I mean, <laughs> one occasion we got picked up by two, two guys who were who just got so drunk and wasted on weed and mm. and whiskey and were offering us all this and we said no no we're fine and eventually i i, did, I whispered to julia my friend i said look we we got to get out of here mm-hmm. so we managed to stop the car and I, I cannot imagine they were going to mexico i don't know how they ever <laughs> got there so anyway we first got of all up. they're headed the wrong way yeah <laughs> well they were going oh they were around. going north and then yeah, right yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah uh so anyway so so we eventually get get to new orleans and and uh, we end up at this on st philip street and uh julia says to me well let's get let's go and get a go and get a job in the pizza place mm-hmm. so we do this and uh i'm on this moped moped flying around the french quarter delivering these pizzas to greek whorehouses and this that and the other and <laughs> so we uh, uh, we finally get enough money to get a greyhound bus to los angeles and that's where i end up staying for about six months. And did you um, did you know anybody? Did you sleep on a couch no, or you no, got a we, you got a, no, a flat? Know anybody we okay. were flying by the seat of our pants, mm-hmm. and I ended up a very depressing few weeks living in a van while mm-hmm. she went off and became an au pair and lived the good life. You know? Of course, <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that was the beginning of it all. You know, I get to L.A. and I'm 20 years old and I'm hanging out at the baked potato listening to Steve Lukather and Robin mm-hmm. Ford, right. who were kids too. You know? Right. Yeah, it was very inspiring. You know, one of the things that, that I want to know, <clears throat> because you had a similar experience as I did and as so many of my guests have, when you when yeah. you moved here, you had to get a regular job. You yeah. had to find a way to make some yeah. money. Yeah. And I know that you learned a valuable lesson from I that. Did. I want to know what that story yeah, yeah. is. Well... 
uh, I did a couple of things. When I first got into town, by the way, I had already be- become a professional musician in for 10 years in London before I made the big move to L.A. Right. But I was still pretty young. You know, I just hit 30 years old. Right. But you were proficient. I was a pretty good player. Yeah. Now, I, I wasn't what I am now, but I was a pretty good player. Mm-hmm. I had a lot of experience. I could sight read well. Mm-hmm. I could play in all styles. Um, this, that, and the other, you know. Right. And uh, so when I got here, uh, I shacked up with a crazy woman for for just a little bit, <laughs> and uh, and I and I needed to make some money, and I wasn't making enough. I'd, right. I'd have the odd student and the odd little gig at uh, Le Cafe. Do sure. you remember? Yeah, I this, did. This, that, and the other, but it just wasn't enough. And um, I just, you know, before I moved here, I, I I told myself, look, you cannot be above doing what it takes to get on in this town because it's not London, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, so one of the little jobs I did was I was delivering employment magazines to liquor stores across the country, across the, uh, the, city. the town. Yes. Yeah. And for every stop that I did, I think I, I made a dollar a stop, <laughs> right? Uh, and and it quickly, I quickly realized that uh, who's checking whether I make these stops or not? So I end up scamming the system, mm-hmm. whereas you know I might make a few stops and then turn in a, a, a sheet of addresses. Where anyway, so for a few weeks I was I was doing this and not feeling good about it, but it was such a dumb job. And uh, eventually, I just stopped doing it because I felt so guilt ridden. <laughs> <laughs> so that so, but that that. There was one more situation where I thought, oh, I've just got to make another 50 bucks to make the rent at the end of the month. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it was like that. Yeah. And I answered this. By the way, ad- it was like that for so many of us who yes, have been on this course. show. I'm sure, I'm sure it has to be for everybody who's, yes. who's in the entertainment profession. So there was this one time uh, I answered a little ad in a local paper. I think it was The Recycler. Yes, remember the Recycler? I do. And uh, it was just some guy who who said, you know, uh, part time work, blah 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 blah. Call now. So I call this guy, and he's he's just so enthusiastic. He basically he's he's telling me that he's got this product that he's selling at fairgrounds, and it's just it's basically balloons, but each balloon's got this flashing dildo attached <laughs> to them. <laughs> Of course, and 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 he's saying this. I mean, it's, we're going to make millions. I mean, he. I, it was hilarious. Of course, I was this you know young kid who was taken in by it all, all yeah. too. He said, "Come down this Sunday, and and you know, just you've got to experience it. You've just got to see this." So I, I don't know why he he got me all excited for some <laughs> strange reason. I, I said, "What am I doing on Sunday?" Right, <laughs> right. So I get in my nineteen seventy nine Honda Accord uh-huh. hatchback. Drive down to Fountain Valley. Oh right? yeah, that's a, which was long, Very, long, long yeah, way from. It's where another I was. world. Yeah, from Los Park Angeles. my car, yeah. walk across to this fairground, meet this guy, and uh, he had. I, and by the way, I'm dressed in my suit jacket because I'm thinking I've got to make the right impression. You know, everybody else is like, just like they've got three teeth, right? Shorts and, and a yeah, t-shirt. They can, <laughs> Yeah, I mean they're just a, just a mess. You know? <laughs> so, so anyway, I, he, he gives me these balloons with these flashing dildos. And I think, well, he wasn't lying. <laughs> 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 so I, he said, "Well, go across across the way and then just stand there for twenty minutes and and, and sell these things, you know, and it'll, it'll happen really easy." So I go across the way. I'm I'm sitting there like a lemon for <laughs> twenty minutes. Nothing's happening, and I'm feeling so embarrassed. I'm overdressed, you know. And after 15 minutes, I go back and I hand him his balloons back, and I said, uh, "I'm sorry, mate. This is this this is not for me." And he said, "You know what, Chris? I can't believe you said this." He said, "You look like you might be better suited for an executive position." <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I said goodbye. I got in my Honda Accord, and I came back to LA, and it was a massive, massive changing moment for me because I thought, if you take a part-time job. How much work does it involve doing a job for somebody else? A massive, it takes a massive commitment and energy. If I want to sell those balloons or, or, or deliver those employment magazines, it's, it's, it's a big deal. You know, you have to put a lot of energy into it and a lot of effort. And I'm thinking, what if I don't do any of that and I put all that energy and commitment into my music career? If it means me getting up early in the morning, putting on a suit, 
driving down to Beverly Hills and, and knocking on restaurant doors and saying, I will sit at the back of your restaurant and play classical guitar and, and all the pizza I can get, and I'm happy. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And that's what I did. It just stepped up my hustle. You right. know what I mean? Yeah. And I decided I'm never gonna do I'm never gonna do anything like this ever again. I'm and whatever it takes to get, you know, enough gigs a week or throughout the month, that's what I'm gonna do. And I did it. And something turned in because because I'd made that that commitment and that decision to be only a professional musician, I became one pretty quick. I love that you said that that because that that level of of clarity and focus and passion yeah. when they all intersect yeah. in those moments yeah. but it took that moment sure to get that clarity yeah. you know what I mean and yeah, it's yeah. a bizarre story but but it's the truth you know what I mean it's a great story yeah. and and you know and, and you without that experience you wouldn't have really been ready to make that shift that shift wouldn't have happened without I, that experience. I think, I think it instilled a work ethic into me that I might not have had quite so quickly. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I it mean, I, but I also it made me realize I'm in Los Angeles. Damn it, this is not London, right? You know, this is LA. I mean, this, the best players in the world are here, and and they're all hustling, you know right? I mean? So who am I to think? That uh, that I can't do what they're doing times ten. You know that's the, that's the effort that I have to put in. I'm new in town. You know. Well, that question, "Who am I to to be able to do that to yeah. accomplish that?" is a question that fascinates me yeah. about all of us because you, as well as I, hmm. um, made a decision at some point to be an artist. Yes. To make yeah. our own records. Who. Who are you? Who yeah. do you think you are that entitles you yeah. or qualifies you to, to especially be to be that guy, especially yeah. when you made your well, first record? It's a great question, but it's not the question that I asked because when I came to LA, I didn't know if I was going to be an artist. I I had found that when I came to LA, I had zero intention of being an artist. Yeah. I'm not sure I had any intention. I I just was sick of London. I, I, I needed more for whatever reason. But I did find that when I lived in London, if I was having any kind of career at all, it was from doing my own things, writing music that the BBC had commissioned, you know, like these little late night sessions I would do for them and I would arrange and bring in bands. Mm-hmm. And so I was a semi producer, you right. know. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I had a band that I would do like 50, 60 gigs a year with, you know, and I'd bring in all these players. So I became known as a guy that you would work for rather than a guy that mm-hmm. would be called. Work with. Yeah. yeah. So I came here thinking, and I, and I would do sessions for TV shows mm-hmm. and, and jingles and things like that. A little bit, you know, not, not, I wasn't one of the first cool guys by any means, but, but I did a, you know, a certain amount. You were making a living. I was one being of the guys on the list. Absolutely. You know I mean? Yes. Uh, so you also knew how to show up on time and be, all of that. Yeah, I, I knew what they wanted. I knew that I had to be cool and professional, all that stuff. So I that came thing. here thinking I would do that, right? You know, um, and, and interesting enough, Terry, I came here with the exact same problems that I experienced in London. Mm-hmm. The exact same issues that I found. I, I've always been a bit of a loner, mm-hmm. always a bit of a somebody who makes stuff happen on his own. That I tend to hire people for you know and that that's kind of where it was going in london you know what i mean uh, i i always felt a little bit kind of castigated from from these scenes you know i was not part of any particular scene and i, I would watch people who were in these scenes and i felt totally left out you know mm-hmm. what i mean and i came here and maybe it was a, a cultural thing because i'm british but i felt that too you know what i mean yes and i so i my natural instinct was, well, I better make some stuff happen. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. So I put a band together just like I did in London. Right. And I hired the best players I could because yeah. I wanted my music to be played the way I heard it. You mm-hmm. know, I, I would write music out. So I got better at arranging. And, and, uh, and then before you know it, I'm, I, I, I jump on a tour with uh, a guy called Mark Antoine. Yes. Guitar player. Uh, he, because I'm literally just playing second guitar in his band. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'd do that for a year and a half. And he asked me to do this. this there's a tour called Guitars and Saxes that mm-hmm. went out 
out for a few years. And Mark wanted to get me on this because it was basically four guys, Kirk Wylam, the sax player, Rick Braun, trumpet player, Peter White, guitar player, and Mark, mm -hmm. guitar player. So four artists with one band. So Mark got me, he really championed for me to be in the band that would back all these four people. Now, that was a big turning point too. I feel like he's one of the only people that's ever really busted a gut to get me on something. Now, it's probably because he wanted me on it because he liked the way I was backing him. Yeah, but it's still rare for but people to step up on rare. behalf of it, it's, it, it, it's their It's so peers. rare. And we yeah. don't forget these moments, you know. And I, and I remind him all the time how thankful I am, you know. Anyway, so I get on that tour and immediately I'm meeting these four other guys. Mm -hmm. So I'm thrust into this contemporary jazz scene that I was never before. Mm -hmm. And before you know it, I've got these guys on my first album and mm -hmm. I get a record deal in New York right. and, and I'm off to the races, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, it became, it was still hard for a number of years, but uh, I was kind of, I was set now. I, it, it was like I had a kind of a hit record on, on my first album you know semi mm -hmm. everybody knew that i was doing this, this now right and so i wasn't called to be a side man anymore and and uh i know there's a lot of people that that do still get called to be a side man but i was i was literally off the list immediately mm -hmm. you know what i mean there is a perception it is very interesting yeah. there's a perception that if you're an artist then sometimes yeah. they they believe assume that you're no longer available to do sessions or that's they just don't view you that yeah. way i also think i could have had a bad attitude to, <laughs> to, be, to, to being a side man you know i think dur during the later time uh -huh. like, as i was just getting off the races with my solo career yeah my attitude towards side man could i i mean people have looked at me as a snotty nose <laughs> upstart from london for many years and i i've agreed with them and you what know. you were I probably was. That's I'm, pretty I'm, self aware I, I, of you. Yeah, to say I, that. I'm. I'm pretty sure that mm -hmm. that I pissed off a few people, mm -hmm. not from anything I did drastically, but just my lofty attitude is right. like, you know, really, do you want me to play this? Really? <laughs> I mean, I didn't say that. Do you know what I mean? But th yeah. they might have read the, the the fact that I thought, sure, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I think my future was set well before I even knew it. You know. <laughs> But you have managed to, um, and partially, I, I, you, certainly from being a prolific composer, mm. and and you know making great records, but also, uh, and performing around the world. But you also teach. You know, you you have yeah. put your focus. Well, actually, I, I should should stop you there because I don't teach. In fact, I used to teach for, for a long time. I haven't actually given a private lesson for probably. At least twenty five years. When I say teach, I'm yes. talking about your your video series I do that. and your master classes. Yes, it's, a, it's an online. Uh, I do online guitar instruction. Yes, where I'm basically uh, pre designing uh, videos and online. So it's, there's nothing interactive. I mean, the, the programs are, but right. I'm not there. Right. I'm not there to interact. But it's still your no. point of view. But it's my point of view, and I, I and these programs that I've written is basically everything I know about music. I, I'm not sure I could write another one. Actually, mm -hmm. I don't think I have anything else to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like me saying that I, I'll teach you everything I know about <laughs> conducting after lunch. <laughs> That's probably all I need to know. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, so your your online courses, um, the website is playjazzguitar.com. Yes. Uh, and one of your programs is Play What You Hear. Yeah. Uh, um, was it a natural, does it feel natural for you to write? I'm not talking about writing music, but to be a, a writer, to write your and organize your thoughts as an educator? Um, yes. In fact, I found that in order to get clear in my mind, uh, it's good to get your thoughts out on paper and describe what, what it is you're attempting to do. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I mean, I remember, I was just thinking in the car, this very thing, it's funny, it's coming up. The very idea of, of in the jazz world, there's something called tritone substitution. Mm -hmm. right? I always kind of knew what it was, but when I had to put it in a book and explain it to somebody, that's when I figured out what it was. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, I do. I mean, there's one thing. There's two sides to it. You know, there's this like cordly how it how it works, and how you might adopt uh, playing around that sequence as a soloist. Mm -hmm. And it's that side of it that I hadn't fully explored until I until I had to tell other people about it <laughs> well that makes complete sense to yeah. me because i one of the things that 
you might not know this about me, but I've studied martial arts for over oh, no 20 kidding. years. I did not know yeah. that. Wow. Um, and one of the things that I've learned in karate, I started when I was 40. So wow. late in life from having a bicycle accident and hurting yeah. my neck and having you know, a, a spinal fusion and everything. Right. It's wow. part of my recovery. And it's been amazing. Yeah. Um, but what they, they taught us was there was this phrase, watch one. Try one, yeah. teach one. Yeah. You know, and same thing. That's like when you were even as a white belt in karate, they would teach you something. You could barely do it, but you would just practice over and over again. And then somebody new would come in class. They'd make you start to teach them right. how to do it. That was part of how you ah. got it. And my, my cousin, who's a doctor, said it was the same in medical school. Yeah. You know, watch one, try one, teach one. Yeah, and, and that's what you're talking about as well, and, I, I and just, having to articulate it. I, I, th- I think that's it. It's it's uh, we mu- the whole thing about music is is uh, we're so in it. It's such a kind of like inculcated thing that we never have to talk about. Mm-hmm. We never have to describe what it is we're doing. And if we did, we'd get tongue twisted sure. all the time. Oh, absolutely. So so I think it's it's good to get clear as well. You know, right? Um, I, although I do love the idea that. That it's just in you, you know. It's like I mean, Miles Davis said, you know, learn your theory and then forget it. But uh, so there's yeah. that aspect of it too. But but there's a, there's a lot about music I don't know, and I I still want to know about. You know, you're so, still curious. I'm still curious about it. Yeah, me too. Yeah. There's that's part of the beauty of of um, our careers and yeah. and our our passion and where where it lies is that. If you stay curious, you can't possibly learn everything there is yeah. to learn about what it is that no, we no. love. And, and, and I, lo- I want it that way because uh, I don't want to just stop because oh. I know it all. Yeah. I mean, God. I, mean it's, it's, I clearly don't know it, know it all. I don't want to know it all. Nobody does. Well, you know? I mean, recently I know you, you went through this little journey of finding the perfect classical guitar for yourself so that yes. you could start playing classical guitar again. Yeah. And, and, and that's a, a beautiful example of that. Yeah, it's actually um, uh, that was also an, another clarity moment for me. I might have told you this, but uh, I started out as a classical guitar mm-hmm. player, and I, now I've got this just stunningly beautiful classical guitar uh, made in in Madrid by this um, luthier called Sergio Perez, which I just I just love it. I think it's incredible. It's got this beautiful big tone, and it just makes me want to pick it up, mm-hmm. you know, and just just. Hear the tone. Right. I just know when all is said and done and my career's over, nobody cares anymore. <laughs> I don't care anymore. <laughs> you know? Yeah. When I've said all I need to, mm-hmm. I will sit down 80 years old, hopefully, if I'm still around, and I will sit all day with that classical guitar and I will play through my Bach preludes and fugues mm-hmm. just for the mere sake of doing it. Yeah. I don't, I'm, I'm not doing a gig. I'm not playing for anybody else. I'm not recording. I just want to end the way I began. Yeah. And I think that's pretty cool, you know? I do, too. We, yeah. were, we were just talking about that last night, like when we um, hit our 80s. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we're not going to be working as hard as we no. do now. Let's hope not. No. <laughs> <laughs> I do hope not. Yeah. Um, but I said, I'm still going to be playing my ukulele and yeah. my guitar and, yeah. and just, you know, yeah. for the joy of it. Well, oh, music's never going to li- leave your system, and it, it just people have tried, but it never ever does. <laughs> right. You know? So I say, why should it? Just you just got to, you know. Let me ask you some music business questions, because yes, because yes, yes. I view you as somebody who, um, it, it might be a stretch to say that you're a good businessman, because I don't know many musicians who are great business people, mm-hmm. but but you've got a good grasp. I mean, you, yeah, you have... I'm a, I'm a bit left brain and right brain, which is rare. I do. It is. I, I do know. Yeah. It is. And, yeah. and you've got a willingness to... I, yeah, to I, I, I'm actually... Put your foot very, in it and get involved. Very curious. I, I think of it as a creative thing. It, right. And, and I also think of it as a game that I, I would like to win. Yes. Somehow. So, or be in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I've got a few questions for yeah. you. Um, and based on our previous longer personal conversations about streaming... Right. So what, you know, what's your philosophy right now these days yeah. about streaming and how, how has that impacted you as an artist? I know that you've embraced it as, yeah. as have I, but where do you see it? You know, yeah. since you've, you have done this experiment of just putting it out there in the world, yeah. every way that you can stream it, you've said yes to. I have. And I, uh, yes, Is because that I, paid I, off? I, I think that's right. Because I'm not Taylor Swift. 
Yeah. And if if Taylor Swift says I'm not going to put it on Spotify, then everybody will go and get it how they can get it. Yeah. And it'll, and uh, she's not going to be impacted. I'm not her. Um, and I think that if I ran an experiment and decided not to put one record on Spotify, I wouldn't make more or less money. I th- I think. Uh, I mean, I would probably, if anything, make a little less. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm in the catalogue game. Right. And I, I'm also lucky in that my audience has sort of grown up with me, so mm-hmm. we're all a little bit older, and still people have still got their CD players, right? and they still want signed CDs at shows. So I'm still selling enough physical product to, to ma- keep manufacturing that. Um, and the, But the streaming thing is, you know, I, 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 I look at the... I look at the statements every month and see how it's going, and it's actually going quite well. Mm-hmm. And specifically because my catalog's growing. It, if it's about catalog, you, m- my thing is I've just got to keep the machine alive, you know. And at some point, more people will be listening to the streaming. Yes. So therefore, there'll be um, more income, and uh, and it's t- to me, it's about. It's about getting more fans, and I understand that I'm not getting younger fans, but mm-hmm. if I could get more of the older ones, right. I'm happy. You know what I mean? So for our listeners, mm. you know, and for um, for the monetizing aspect of this conversation, yeah. where are you? Um, how are you generating this income? Uh, sound, I would imagine sound exchange is one place exactly. where you're registered. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there's, there's a few different sources. I have a physical distributor mm-hmm. who who uh, is essentially dealing with amazon.com mm-hmm. which is a nightmare to do on your own yes as you know mm-hmm. so i i i mean that's worth it right there and he admin, he he basically sends out to about 200 mom and pop stores on top of amazon and he deals with a couple of what they call one stops mm-hmm. so that's physical physical product that's physical yes yeah. so that's one slice of the pie then we have digital distribution which um we've talked about i mm-hmm. mean i use a company called TuneCore, but there's many of them you know? yes uh, so that's another slice of the pie, and that's that basically covers a part of streaming, uh, iTunes, and and uh, and all the other online sites. I mean, part of Pandora comes into that, I believe. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, there's there's a lot there's a lot to, to to collect from from those digital sources. So that so your digital aggregator will do that. So mm-hmm. that's two parts of the pie. Then there's Sound Exchange, which deals with. Uh, Basically, collection of collection f- of uh, it's the it's artist money from internet. Is it radio? I think it's mostly radio. Isn't I it? think it's they call ambiguous. it. There's terrestrial, and then there is the the terminology keeps changing. But I still yeah. view it as radio. Yeah, but it's but it's internet. It's, it's not internet terrestrial. radio. Yeah, no, it's, it's right. It's, it's internet. It's inter- internet right. radio. And that's if you've got if you're playing the the radio game that we are, then or, that's, and that would include television as like the the uh, TV, uh, it, yes, the, like the music, music choice, like, etc. Exactly, yeah. So so sound exchange is becoming very very important, especially if you're playing the radio game. Absolutely. Uh, so there's that. Then there's BMI, mm-hmm. which take care takes care of terrestrial radio, yes, and performance other other performance situation, uh, li- licensing to TV shows and things like that. So that's four parts of the... Are there any other secret societies for collection agencies that that you know about? Um, I don't think there's any... I'm being sarcastic. uh, I wish there there was, but but anyway, other than that, there's selling physical merch at shows. Yes. And website, on your own website. Yes. So that's that could be... I mean, that's usually something at the beginning of of an album release. I'll Mm -hmm. send a couple of hundred online and then the rest is the through the public right you know d- distributors um and speaking of you do yeah. have a new album that came out recently i know you're in the studio you're already working on your next one which is yeah. pretty exciting well every but... two years i try to 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 come out with a new studio album yes so this year i came up out with a, a best of remixed album mm-hmm. which was not i mean it was hardly my record actually it was more like i had assigned two producers to remix, you know, some of my most popular songs, sure. which they did in a very different way. It's mm-hmm. it's, it's actually probably the most unme record that I've released. Do you mm-hmm. know what I mean? Uh, 
Although I have got a couple of remixes that I did on it too, mm-hmm. but uh, I like it in a way because it's you're not it's, that record's not going to be for everybody, right? Because uh, it's a, it can be a little bit on the edgy side. Mm-hmm. You know? But um, so I, that came out this year, and of course now I'm finishing up a studio album for beginning of next year. Mm-hmm. So, so I'll tour off this record next year. And and you still. Um as many of us do, find time to to co-write or produce other artists like yeah, our friend Tom I do. Rotella. I'm actually I'm actually doing more and more of that. Good, um, and uh, I'm enjoying it too, yeah. just because it's I get sick of me. You know what I mean? Oh <laughs> I my do. goodness, I do. I do because you know it's not like when you're a side man, you you do one bum gig and you go, oh great, I can go and do this this weekend. I'll be all right. Right, but. Uh, I sometimes I get sick of hearing me, yeah. you know, and my my choice of sounds and everything like that. I mean, I'm I'm always proud at the end of a record, sure. and it's you know I I know if it's good or not. But uh, sometimes I just need a breather. And, and having said that, if I work with these other guys, I'm still putting me in it. Right, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. But, um, but it's nice if I can. Uh, have some success with somebody else. Yeah. And I, it, it makes well, me and sure really your good. experience and, and your perspective, yeah. your point of view. Yeah. You know, ad- additionally to the the back to what we were talking about, the yep. digital and physical releases, you're also releasing your music on vinyl. Uh, well, just just this remix just project this is probably the one and only time I'll do it. And w- why would you say that? Is it not a lucrative uh, thing to it, do? It, it, it's actually, you know, that before I did it, a few people would send me emails saying, you've got to release it on vinyl. You've sure. got to release it. On. Well... If eight people are telling me that I've really got to release it on vinyl, I know I'm going to sell eight copies. That's you know? right. <laughs> but but the but the the other five hundred. If they're true to their word. Yeah, the other other four hundred and ninety <laughs> whatever it is, I've copies I've I've made. I've yeah. got to I've got to sell those. Um, so, and you know, I sell a few gigs sure. and on online from time to time. My distributors have taken a, a bunch, but yeah. at the end of the day, it's it it's not. I I don't think it's where our business is going. It it might be a very vital. Uh, form of business for more the millennial artists because they're not they're not buying any CDs right and it's new to them right but there's a novelty to buy a, a, an LP yeah, yeah yeah I mean it's nice to have a big LP sign absolutely uh, people like that but but at the end of the day it's it's a lot of product to store in your garage yes so you might not be <laughs> doing that again I, yeah <clears throat> I'm I'm not I'm not going to be in a hurry to do it again okay yeah. I mean, I'm not saying I won't, mm-hmm. but, uh, you know, we'll see. Um, there's a, a quote of yours um, about your creative process as yeah. a composer, and and I'll read it. Over the years, I've created a style where I'm able to say something musically that can be appreciated universally. It's the perfect balance. Mm. The little details of making an album make it a lengthy, deeply immersive process, but there's something incredible that happens when a germ of an idea is fleshed out. Can you describe your creative process when you sit down to write and the blank slate of... Yeah, well, let me just address the beginning of that. Okay. I'm really, really interested in writing music that the people want to listen to. Hmm. Um, I mean, I used to be a fusion guitar player, and the very idea of writing unlistenable unlistenable music doesn't interest me. Uh, I appreciate it. Did it ever? I mean, Uh, really? I don't think it did for me. It, it never it never really connected. I, I never got the sense that you were that yeah. self indulgent as an artist that you would it seemed like you have like I do, a, a sort of a commercial yeah. default well, of yeah, here's the thing. Or a pop I, default, perhaps. I just like melody. Me too. You know what I mean? I just I you know, if I l if I think of the jazz musicians that I like mm-hmm. It's Chet Baker, yeah. Melody. Mm-hmm. It's Stan Getz, mm-hmm. Melody. It's Paul Desmond, yes. Melody. You know, um, just who are, I'm trying to think of it. Pat Metheny, Melody. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That's that's the music that gets to me, and it, maybe it's my classical background. Mm-hmm. I ju- I, the very idea of, of listening to angular music with discordant harmonies underneath it. Uh, it, it feels like I'm having my teeth drilled. I think it's your classical background, yeah. and I, I, because I'm relating to what you say, and, and perhaps speaking for myself as well, but yeah. it's also your pop R&B background, the, the music that we came up on. It might be that. to radio. Yeah, it might be that. That really like, infused yeah. our childhood yeah. was melodically driven. But is it, it is interesting to me, what makes somebody gravitate towards Ornette Coleman? 
and want to buy all his albums. Right. And somebody who who gravitates to, to listening to, you know, something mm-hmm. much more listenable, like like Paul Desmond, right? Or, you know. Um. Anyway, the, the the point is that that's going to that's going to create the bed for whatever I do, you know, because I want to, I want to, whatever whatever I write is gonna gonna be m- melodically based, mm-hmm. and and if it makes me happy, I like to think that it's listenable, so people will. We'll get it. Um, I also think that I mean I've always been very interested with infectious music, mm-hmm. uh, you know, like soulful grooves, mm-hmm. organic instruments like B three, Fender Rhodes, um, in many instances upright bass. You mm-hmm. know, uh, so th- those organic sounds and feels are going to also lay the bed for whatever it is. I'm going to write, you know. Right, but you're also not afraid to combine that with a cool loop. No, because the loop because I'm I'm always cr- looking for a little magic. Mm-hmm. I mean, no, I'm not magic will win every time mm-hmm. over technical or or clever. Mm-hmm. That I'm looking for that little bit of magic and it, and if the usually the magic is in some kind of rub. Yes. You know? Yes, yes. And uh, a loop is nothing but that. <laughs> so you you put a loop in there, which has sometimes got a little tone of something in there. Mm-hmm. That's, there's going to be a rub against something, right? And it's and it's that rub that creates a little tension. And then you know you put some beautiful little string part on top of it, and it and all of a sudden it makes it okay, yeah, and listenable, you know. But uh, so I, I'm I'm interested in those elements of of writing, mm-hmm. you know, and it, it it never goes away. I'm mm-hmm. always looking for that, you know. I mean, just to give you an example, I might find I, I might program a groove with a, with a uh, with a chord progression that I like, and I go, oh god, this what this thing needs something. Otherwise, I'm going to throw it away. Sure. Yeah. So I will literally just I will open a folder of of samples, I, right? And and they'll they won't be in any, any time or key. I'm literally just on the fly. You're fishing, auditioning. For some magic, yeah, and I and I've done this so many times, and I've used a lot in, yeah. in my past records. Sure. In fact, very often that little bit of magic will will become the germ of an idea that writes a song. Mm-hmm. I mean, I can even name some of my songs sure. that that did. Too. Um, so, I I just want something special. I don't want just you know if you go in the studio with a live band and you. And you just have everybody play. That's not enough. Mm-hmm. It's not enough for me. Right. I don't care how well it's recorded. <laughs> I want something special. That's yeah. not special to me. Yeah. You know? Which is probably why I've always made records the way I do. Uh, I think I should do it the other way at least one time <laughs> for the experience. <laughs> just, just because I, I, I need to keep my options open and change my mind and things like that. I, I think it will still f- feel like you. Because you have yeah. such a strong point of view. And, you know, one of the things that we were talking about off the air before our conversation today was um, both of us having home studios yeah. and having bigger studios and littler studios right. and downsizing right. and and having this awareness that it really isn't about the room anymore. It's yeah. not about the gear. It's no, not about it's anything. Not. It's about... It's about the magic. The magic. Yeah. You had used the word the clarity, the preparation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah the, those things that... As a matter of fact, you had said, um, I believe that, you know, if you really have a clear idea and then pick the right people. Yeah. Oh, that's right. We were talking about that. Yeah. yeah. We were talking about bringing in different drummers. Yeah. Yeah. Instance. Sure. And uh, one's uh, not uh, necessarily any better right, than the, the other. At the end of the day, if if you are super clear on, on, on what that song is or that what that composition is, and you've even gone so far as to write drum parts out. That's right. Know, yeah. And... Which is the way I do. I write my bass parts out, write my drum parts. I, everything's, you know, I'm when they come in, I'm wide open to something being better. But at the end of the day, they have such a, a strong framework to work within. Anyway, I believe when you are that clear going into a session, you're literally just hiring a guy you like. <laughs> <laughs> they all can do the job. But not just musically, personally. Yes, somebody that yeah. you like. I mean, we were talking about all these different drummers. Sure. You know, I, you know, I've just hired Chris Coleman, who mm-hmm. played with Prince and Beck, and he's probably my favorite 
player du jour, you know, <laughs> and he's just just wonderful. But but you were also talking about Jr. John Robinson, right. who is obviously just a, a hero hero of ours and yeah. amazing. And but I know a, that but it's the same relationship. Right. Friendship. But the point is, if I go, if, if I have this piece of music that that's arranged and is that clear, and I go in and we, and we bring in Jr. to play on it, it's going to sound amazing. I then we do another session with the same song. I bring in Chris. He plays it. It's going to sound amazing too. That's the right. fact is, what do you prefer? Yes. It becomes down to what you prefer because the, both will be amazing. Right. So you've just got to make a choice at that point. Yeah. You know? There's not a wrong way to do that. Whereas if you're not that clear, you're literally asking these guys to, to, to feed you inspiration so you mm. do know what you want. And I find that exhausting. Right. <laughs> and yeah. so do they. Yeah. And, they, and so do they. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. What? What lessons we're we're getting towards the end of yeah, our conversation, yeah, yeah, yeah. so I want to get close to our um, our closing questions. But before I do that, what lessons about music and about life have you learned along your journey? Ooh, uh, what lessons about life and music? Oh, there's a lot. Terry. Yeah, there are. There um, are. I, I think the the. I, I, it might, I, I might need a question to be a bit more specific, but, but as a general rule, it, I, I mean, I've, I've learned that I can't do without it. You know, that's the, I mean, the one lesson is that, that if, if, if I, I was to have an arm that was severed, for instance. Yes. <laughs> Which, by the way, I think about that. So <laughs> yeah. I totally I mean, get where you're going I, I, with this. It wouldn't be hard to do, would it? It wouldn't. No. And life is fragile so and there's no guarantees. what would I do? Yes. I, I, I've thought about this. If I couldn't play the guitar, for yes. instance, if I couldn't play... If I couldn't play the keyboard, yes. for instance, I, w- I would somehow have to write some music. I would, you know, if I, I think about going to prison, what would I do if mm-hmm. I was, I would demand some manuscript paper and a pencil. Right. And I would probably be fine after a while. Mm-hmm. You know? I, that, that's never going to go away. So, so deal with it, embrace it, you know, right. and everybody has to embrace that too. <laughs> um, what about endorsements? What's your yeah. philosophy? I know that, um, you are like I am um, particular about who you yeah. su- you put your name to and and collaborate with. Um, I know you have yeah. a, a guitar endorsement. Well, it's actually it's it's actually simpler than that with me. I'm really really not interested in gear. Mm-hmm. I have no interest. In, I, I mean, you know, I I have lots of gu- guitar player friends who've got racks of mm-hmm. gear and pedals upon pedals, yeah. and I look at it. I I I, I would know what to do with these, you know. <laughs> Um, I mean, if you saw my pedal board, my touring pedal board, it's, yeah. it's literally like it's just not even a foot wide. I'm down to that size, also. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, my thing is, I play a jazz guitar, right? So you give me an amp with a nice little reverb, and I'm he- in you heaven. Could. I don't really need anything else. So, so what am I going to endorse? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I, I use Benedetto guitars because mm-hmm. I, I truly believe they're the best in the world, and, mm-hmm. and I just, I love them. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to endorse them big time. And other than that, when I go out on the road, they rent me amps, which I'm pretty happy with. Yeah. You know, I mm-hmm. mean, as, as long as I have a, a good, fat, clean sound. Right. I've got a nice little reverb I can put on it mm-hmm. and I'm happy. So I, I'm not, I'm not the, the best guy to call to, to endorse your gear. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Duly noted. <Yeah. laughs> you can try. <laughs> all of you music companies that are listening to our conversation yeah. today. Um, we, and typically you bring your Benedetto, and do you still carry a Strat with you, or you no, pick one up? No, uh, I I used to. Um, boy, I play it. I'm very, a little. I play it a little bit dangerously these days. Mm-hmm. I, I jump on a plane with one guitar. Right. Yeah. And I I play the gig. Yeah. And. Um, God knows what would happen if if something happened, right? You know, it's There's it's no not very smart of me, but I but I, I've got a few friends who are doing that too. Uh, I it, it would be it would be smart for me to put on the rider a spare guitar, and mm-hmm. I, I need to start doing that. Yeah, because I mean, heaven forbid, you know, my neck just sure. cracked or something. I and are, are I you, can't imagine it ever would, but you know, are you carrying it on board all the yes, time? Yes, always. Yes, yeah, and I, actually, I'm playing a. a, a Sort of a smaller size jazz guitar mm-hmm. for this simple reason that I can take it on the plane. Mm-hmm. Uh, because when, as, as soon as you put it in the holds, that's when the problem starts. Absolutely. So, provided I don't have to do that, I figure I'm kind of okay. Yeah. You know? mm-hmm. Yeah. 
But I'm still, it's still a guess. <laughs> um, so, Chris, for our closing questions, yeah. I ask all of my guests these. Uh-oh. Um, don't, don't panic. <laughs> There's no right answer, no wrong answer. Uh, the first is a two-part question. Yeah. Since this show is called Making It, right. what does making it mean to you both personally and professionally? Yeah. Ooh, I, I've got to attribute this very answer to my good friend Dino Soldo, mm-hmm. who said, making it is simply that. You make it. You make it. You sit down and you and you make a piece of music, and then you then you make a gig. You put a band together. Making it is nothing more than the process of doing what you love. I think the very answer, the, the very idea that you have to put, you know, you you have to quantify something like you, you is. I don't think that makes any sense to anybody, you know. Does that mean that when you've made it that you stop? I mean, no. M- making it is a process. So, and and that's what what the fun is. I mean, you you don't want to you don't want to have a mark on a on a board saying, ah, I did it. I I I played the Albert Hall, or I I released thirty three records. I've made it. Or is it money? I don't. I mean, you might as well put that one out of your <laughs> head for a start. Right. It's and and even if it's in your head, even if you do make a lot of money, how much money do you then need? You know, uh, no, I think I think these are, these are futile questions. I think you you just keep making it, make music. Well yeah. said. Yeah. And the show is called Making It, not Made It. Yeah. It, it's a verb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a process. What um, can you share three tips for sex for success that have driven your career? Yeah. Well, I th- I, I, it's funny with it that we've um, talked about this clarity. Mm-hmm. I, I think the problem with a lot of people is there's so many facets to the music business and people want to be in the music world and they end up in a place that they didn't start and they might get there sooner if they know what they want to do if you're super clear if you're super clear you you can streamline things i think i mean you still need w- real world experience but take pat Metheny as an example he knew exactly what he wanted to do age 19 yeah. he got in a van and he paid his band nothing mm-hmm. and he went and played all these crummy spots and he and he built his career he kn- always knew he wanted to do that and uh, I so I look at him and I go what if I knew that that's what I wanted to do at age 20 which I did not know you know uh, maybe I, I could have made it before you know <laughs> <laughs> um, so clarity, clarity I think is one um, uh, I think if you're a if you're a an empathic guy, if you understand the the needs of other people, rather than putting your artistry on a pedestal and, and realizing and, and and requesting people to see things your way, you're going to struggle. I think uh, life is a compromise, and if you can be a cool guy or girl and get on well with people, um, you'll you, you'll succeed if you have talent as well. And then third. Practice like a motherfucker, <laughs> you know. Yes. Just be the best guy, best player you can be, because. Oh, and never say you can't do something, hmm. because there will be somebody who comes out from the garage around the corner who will end up doing it, and you'll look at yourself and you go, "Oh God, how did he do that? How did he do that?" There's, there's, you can't, you can't deny. The possibilities in in the music world because somebody's somebody's doing it mm-hmm. right now, or they're gonna you know they're right. ready to do it absolutely. So be open, you know. That might be four. <laughs> That's a bonus round. Yeah, <laughs> they're they're great tips. And my final question, Chris, yeah. <clears throat> at this point of your life, with everything that you know to be true, what would you tell your younger self if you could? Practice the piano. Hmm. I, I don't know why that comes to mind. It's the one thing that I wish I had. Uh, done, you know, because it's coming up now, and uh, I, I I get quite frustrated about the idea that that I I can't do all these things that I should be able to do, and you know, orchestration it lays out on the piano, things like that. Mm-hmm. I can get around it, you know. Yeah. But Hector Berlioz was a wonderful string writer, and he was a guitar player. Uh, not the end of the world, but uh, yeah, I would have liked to have done that. I'm sure there's many other things I can think of, but you know. Well, I can certainly find you a good piano teacher if, <laughs> if you're serious about it. It's that. never too late, is it? it? Is, well, that's my point. Yeah. Yeah. Anything you'd like to close with? 
I, I think what you're doing is amazing. Well, thank I, you. I, I, lo- I love this whole idea of uh, everybody is, especially aspiring to do something in the entertainment arts. They're they they usually if they if they're driven, they're also sponges for information. And you're providing a great thing. So well done, well done. Thank you. I appreciate that, <laughs> and I appreciate you. You're very welcome. Uh, I've really enjoyed spending the hour with yeah, you. Yeah, it's been great, hasn't it? Everybody, let's go and have some lunch. Let's do that. Yeah. Uh, and we're not kidding. No. That's definitely on our <laughs> schedule. So, um, by the way, everybody, thank you for joining us. Go to com. We're going to post the website and other links. And uh, we both appreciate you spending the hour with us. So have a great week, everybody, and see you next week. Yeah. Cheers, Terry. Thanks. Cheers. Thanks. Tune in again next week for another great episode of Making It with Terry Wolf.